Environmental issues have become a major part of the campaign circuit in the US as this election year gets underway. Climate change, offshore drilling and renewable energy are all coming under the spotlight in early campaigning. You're watching Inside Story US 2012 from Washington. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu. Environmental issues have plagued politicians across the world for decades. And in 2012, as the U.S. gears up for another presidential election, it's become one of the major talking points. Republicans are trying to put Democrats on the defensive by calling environmental regulations job killers. And Democrats are working to label Republicans, whose party is often called the GOP or the Grand Old Party, as the Grand Oil Party. President Obama's record over the past three years includes a range of substantial but not game-changing legislation. For example, he's encouraged more solar power generation through grant programs, and he's approved the nation's first offshore wind farm. In July last year, Obama raised the fuel economy standards for cars and light trucks, calling it the, quote, most important step we've ever taken in reducing our nation's dependence on foreign oil. But he's lost the support of some environmentalists during his time in office. First, he failed to push through a cap-and-trade scheme for greenhouse gases, as he'd promised on the campaign trail. In September 2011, Obama forced the Environmental Protection Agency to delay new limits on smog emissions until 2013. He said it was part of an effort to reduce regulatory burdens on business. And he failed to push for an extension of the moratorium on offshore drilling following the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, the largest environmental disaster in U.S. history. So is there a way to improve America's economy without sacrificing environmental concerns? To discuss this, I'm joined by Rick Pilts from Climate Science Watch. He was a member of the federal government climate change science program but resigned in 2005, becoming a whistleblower when he raised the issue of political interference in the climate change reports. Daniel Weiss is the Director of Climate Change Strategy at the Center for American Progress, and Myron Ebel is the Director at the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you. Thanks for having me. Well, Thank let's you. look at President Obama's track record on environmental issues and countering climate change. Let's go back to 2008, two weeks after he was elected president. This is what he had to say. Let's watch. Few challenges facing America and the world are more urgent than combating climate change. The science is beyond dispute and the facts are clear. Sea levels are rising. Coastlines are shrinking. We've seen record drought, spreading famine, and storms that are growing stronger with each passing hurricane season. Rick Pulse, clearly there was the recognition at that time that climate change, environmental concerns were a serious problem and something had to be done about it. How would you assess his performance three years later? Well, I think it's a very mixed record. Before he was inaugurated, uh, Obama referred to climate change as a problem of urgency and national security. But we really haven't seen the U.S. Politi political leadership acting as though they regard this as a problem of urgency. Um, Obama really did not put on a full force effort to move the major climate legislation during the two, first two years that he was in office. He's been limited in what he can bring to the international treaty talks by not having the legislative uh, backing on that. But uh, he has really failed to articulate the problem uh, of connecting what, what climate scientists are saying with the need for a strong policy. He doesn't, in his last State of the Union address, he didn't even mention climate change. So he's backed away from it. He hasn't really taken ownership of the issue. He hasn't educated or mobilized public opinion. And I think it's letting a very important opportunity go by. It's a failure of leadership in that respect. Okay, Myron Ebel, uh, there's something of an industry out there which is dedicated to promoting the idea that climate change is a myth. Uh, in fact, as one of the conferences recently heard, uh, someone describe it as a Trojan horse designed to abolish capitalism and replace it with some kind of eco-socialism. Now, you've been described by the Financial Times as one of the most prominent climate change skeptics in the United States. Do you believe that this phenomenon does exist? 
Uh, I think that's a, an overstatement. I think uh, what we find is that uh, no matter what the reason given, uh, whether it's climate change or uh, creating green jobs or a new green economy, uh, the goal or the answer is always the same, which is less use of energy, uh, a shrinking economy, and a lot more heavy regulation of the economy. Um, I think that the, uh, the climate science that President Obama said was not in dispute. Uh, in fact, every item that he gave is, is, is in dispute, and perhaps one of the reasons he's become uh, less uh, enthusiastic about bringing up climate change is that the rate of sea level rise has not gone up. Uh, the, the number of hurricanes uh, has not gone up every year, as he said it would. Uh, and in fact, of course, there's a lot of evidence that severe weather events uh, will decline if global warming occurs, and that if, if we have global cooling, we'll actually have more big winter storms that disrupt the economy and kill people. Okay, Daniel Weiss, has the president got his facts wrong there? Uh, no, in fact, um, Myron is what part of the 1% of people who do not uh, believe that climate science is human-induced and that we need to reduce our emissions. In fact, the National Academy of Sciences found that 98% of all peer-reviewed research over the last few years has been to the conclusion that global warming is real, it's human cause, and it's getting worse. And we're the only democracy in the world where people deny climate science. Even countries like China acknowledge that climate change is here, it's happening, and they have plans to address it. So Myron is putting himself with the 1% of those who are climate science skeptics rather than listening to climate science scientists. In fact, it's like finding a lump in your chest x-ray and w having one doctor say, don't worry about it, and 99 doctors say, you better look at that more carefully and you better address it, and he's going with the one doctor. I don't think that's a sound way of making public policy. Okay, Maren, I'm going to well, give you a chance I, to respond to that. I, I think uh, you know, this whole uh, global warming scare has been so over, uh, exa it's been so exaggerated. Is it a scare? In Isn't it reality? It's, it's, uh, it's based on trying to scare people. Look, in 1988, James Hansen testified before the U.S. Senate, and he predicted that within 20 years, the temperature would be 2 degrees centigrade higher. 20 years later, he testified before the U.S. House of Representatives on the same day in the summer, and he predicted that in 20 years it would be 2 degrees centigrade higher. It's but 20 the years later. Uh, Dan, excuse Myron, me, the excuse me, Dan. Is up 20, a, uh, it's, it's, and a, half it's up about, uh, Dan, excuse me, okay, Dan. In, in about Sorry. the last 20 years, it's up about two tenths of a degree at the most, and that even that is probably exaggerating. So. Uh, these claims that, oh, just in a few years our, our uh, predictions will come true, they aren't coming true. Two-tenths of a degree is a lot different than two degrees. You know, it goes to what, well, who do you believe in this debate? Uh, Rick Pulse, there have been some dishonest practices, haven't they? Uh, you blew the whistle on the White House, which had been, uh, I guess, censoring or editing climate change information in uh, 2005. Um, in fact, the person who was responsible for that, according to information we have, was a man called Philip Cooney, a gentleman called Philip Cooney, whose previous job was at the American Petroleum Institute, which, as we know, represents the interests of big oil. So, and he left uh, the White House to go to Exxon. Exxon Mobil. That's right. Yeah. But so, has there been honesty in this debate? Well, I think in the case of the Bush administration, they came in with a political position. They were not going to regulate the fossil fuel industry. They were not going to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. Um, but th they then went so far as to, to conform the science-related communication to their political position rather than make policy drawing on the best advice that they were getting from the climate science community. My view is that people who are not climate science experts should pay attention when the National Academy of Sciences and the other leading climate uh, scientific uh, uh, entities and assessments call attention to a problem. Um, in this case, it was ideology trumping science. Uh, I wouldn't get drawn off into a science debate with someone who really has no credentials in that area. I think we need to pay attention to the leading experts, and there I think the message is pretty clear and cause calls for a stronger policy than we have now. 
And in okay. fact, um, I think that President Obama has done more than any previous president to reduce the carbon dioxide pollution that is responsible for global warming. The uh, f fuel economy standards, when they finally take full effect, will reduce emissions by two billion tons of carbon dioxide pollution. Is it adequate to address the problem? Not even close. But is it more than we've ever done before? Yes, it is. And we need to build on that. The administration is planning on issuing the first uh, carbon dioxide pollution reduction standards for power plants and oil refineries uh, this sometime this year, and that's going to be another important step forward. Daniel Weiss, you know, we often hear from some quarters uh, this debate, the climate change debate, being framed as a conflict between economic progress and growth and environmental rules. Well, in fact, uh, environmental degradation is bad for the economy. Air pollution costs money. In fact, the National Academy of Sciences estimates that burning coal and oil costs our economy $120 billion a year. So are you saying, are you saying, then, are you saying it's not one or the other? We can't have both. In fact, economic growth and vitality only exists with economic health and ignoring, uh, sorry, ignoring environmental health uh, actually worsens our economy. It's just that companies don't pay the cost. People pay the cost in, you know, thousands of premature deaths, in uh, terms of uh, uh, hospitalizations, healthcare costs, lost productivity. All of those have real economic costs. For example, the new rules that the president just announced that would reduce mercury pollution from power plants will have nine dollars of economic benefit for every one dollar of cleanup costs. This, this is yeah. this is silly. Uh, look, uh, Dan Weiss has this spiel, but uh, the facts contradict him. Uh, President Obama has done more to reduce emissions. It's called economic decline. His policies are causing the economy to stagnate and collapse. That is the, the only way that has been discovered uh, and, and, and has any evidence that, that that's a way to reduce emissions. Well, when Myron, you'd be glad to know that emissions me, Dan, were up in 2010. In, in, so that's good it, news, right? It, well, it shows that the economy is starting to recover a little bit. When the Soviet Union collapsed and the Eastern European economies collapsed, we had a huge decrease in emissions. That's the recipe for how to reduce emissions. If you want less economic growth, and if you think poor people are uh, environmentally healthy and have uh, good uh, 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 personal health, then that's the way we should uh, proceed. I mean, North Korea is the ideal here. They don't have any emissions Oh, at Myron, all. that is just red baiting. Don't be so silly, please. I, well, let, I, let, I'm, let, sorry, let, I'm sorry, Dan. Yeah, okay. I, I'm sorry, Dan. President Obama said before, before he was elected that under my plan of a cap and trade, electricity prices will necessarily skyrocket. When gasoline prices reached $4 a gallon in the summer of 2008, he said, I don't have a problem with that except the rate, uh, the, the quick increase. People need more time to get used to higher energy prices. In other words, they need to get, have more time to get used to having less money in their pockets, Myron, having that less is employment. Silly. He has not done any, has not adopted any policies that either, uh, in, intentionally hugely increase the price of energy or the price of gasoline. Let me contradict. In fact, let me we are producing <laughs> more domestic energy for the first time. We are um, uh, producing more oil here than we are importing for the first time in a dozen years, and that, including and Dan, under the eight years of President Bush. And I'm sorry, Dan, that has, uh, that has nothing to do with President Obama's policies. The, it has to do with so opening bad news the, no, has nothing me. to do with President no. Obama. Uh, good excuse news has me, Dan. To do let with me, him, let me finish. One, let me fault. finish one thought. Uh, U.S. oil production is up because the Bakken field has come in in North Dakota and eastern Montana. Why? Because that's not federal land, it's private land. The federal government can't stop it. Federal oil production is down dramatically in the Gulf of Mexico, the Rocky Mountains, and Alaska My since there are the more Obama rigs now. There are more rigs office. now in the Gulf of Mexico than there were before the BP oil disaster. You, you, okay, you I are you completely missing. All right, I want to put the next question to Rick Pills, but first, let's look at the current state of the debate as far as the election is concerned. Now, some of the Republican candidates, like Newt Gingrich, Rick Santorum, and Rick Perry, say there's no evidence that humans are responsible for climate change. So let's look at the policy plan platforms of some of these candidates. Now, the current frontrunner, Mitt Romney, wants to remove existing limits on carbon dioxide emissions. 
Newt Gingrich and some other candidates want to abolish the Environmental Protection Agency altogether. Ron Paul wants the government to stay out. He says free markets and private property rights are enough to preserve the environment. All the candidates say they will boost domestic oil production by issuing drilling permits quickly. So there's pretty much a consensus as far as, as, far as the Republican candidates are concerned on where they sta stand on environmental rules, uh, changes, and climate change as well. Let's listen to one of those candidates, Newt Gingrich, who uh, said this on the campaign trail. Let's watch this. This is an agency out of touch with reality, which I believe is incorrigible, and you need a new agency that is practical, has common sense, uses economic factors, and in the case right, of uh, pollution, actually incentivizes change, doesn't just punish it. So, Rick Pills, this is a bit radical, isn't it? I mean, is it practical to abolish the Environmental Protection Agency? No, of course not. Uh, that's, I mean, they're responsible for the whole structure of environmental protection law that's been built up over the last 40 years. But we do have a problem that one of our major political parties has really become radical right wing on these issues and on a range of issues. That to me sets the bar rather low for Obama looking sort of all right on these issues. But in fact, and Obama has been good on clean energy, putting clean energy money into the stimulus bill, uh, supporting uh, um, a, a number of things. Um, but but he hasn't really mounted any serious challenge to the fossil fuel industry uh, in terms of coal production, offshore oil drilling, moving to drill for oil in the Arctic Ocean, um, and, 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 and so forth. Uh, really, I think we have a situation now where our politics are driven by the limits that are set by concentrated corporate power. We see it in the energy and environmental area and in others, whether it's financial regulation or health a policy and government, either party, including Obama and the Democrats, will only make policy up to what it seems to be accepted, acceptable to corporate power and wealth. Um, uh, that sets the constraint. And so, in a way, some of the fundamental issues that need to be raised don't even come into play too much in the election campaign because the parties aren't that fundamentally different. And we have unaccountable corporate Rick, I, wealth I, I, and I, I, power I, I, driving I, 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 the sorry, system. Dan, I'll, Dan, I'll get to you in a moment. It's ahead, and also the fact that uh, environmental concerns don't feature very highly uh, when people are asked to prioritize their concerns ahead of the election. Well, I think people are concerned about their economic situation, right. and, and rightly so. I mean, this is a terrible situation. Um, you know, the f financial capital kind of ran the system off the rails and, um, you know, we're still digging out from that and we still have a, a corporate controlled economic system that seems to right. have a, a business model that doesn't really involve um, anything more than extracting all the gains at the top and not caring too much of what happens to, 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 to working people. All right. Um, you know, so that, that's, that's a problem in terms of how the, the, the election campaign gets framed because neither party fundamentally challenges Okay, that. let me go to Dan Weiss. Dan Weiss, do you think the president has a problem there? Do you concede that he's not posed a great challenge to the fossil fuel industry? And in many instances, he's been accused of simply rolling over. I mean, if we look at what happened after the Deepwater Horizon accident, uh, he didn't push very hard to extend that moratorium on drilling in the Gulf. Well, first of all, I think that the president has just in last year taken a number of steps that was strongly opposed by big utilities and big coal. He's put in uh, new safeguards to reduce the pollution that causes acid rain, smog, emits mercury, lead, arsenic, and other toxic and cancer-causing chemicals. Those are strongly opposed by big coal and big utilities. So I take a real issue with, Rick, with what Rick said. Second, the fuel economy standards that are going to save two million barrels of oil a day when they're fully implemented are not very uh, thrilled. I mean, the big oil is not very thrilled with them. It's going to reduce demand for their product. So I think that uh, he has taken uh, important steps to protect public health, save money, and create jobs that big industries are opposed to. Now, the, there's a big disappointment in that he refused to modernize the ozone health smog standard that would have saved uh, 20,000 lives a year. That's unfortunate. And in that case, uh, I would think that Rick's analysis is, is spot on. But I think that's the uh, exception that proves the rule rather than the other way around. 
Myron Ebel, I mean, the president has done a lot as far as environmental, uh, the environment rather, is concerned. Um, I mean, if you look, he's promoted solar and wind power. Capacity has increased from 32, uh, rather from 39 to 52 percent. Uh, he's raised, as we've just been hearing, uh, fuel economy standards, and he's asked federal agencies to look more closely and analyze the impact of greenhouse gases uh, on the environment. Yes, uh, the president, uh, when cap and trade legislation was defeated in the Democratic Congress in 2009 and 2010, the president moved forward with a large set of, of uh, environmental regulations, mostly Clean Air Act, but also some Clean Water Act regulations, which are designed to force energy prices higher, to force Americans to use less energy, and then at the same time, uh, he got through legislation to start uh, to vastly expand the subsidies and the loan guarantees to renewable energy companies, uh, like Solyndra, for example, that has now cost the U.S. taxpayer half a billion dollars. Uh, because these companies, of course, uh, cannot compete in the marketplace. They can only compete with mandates and subsidies because the price, the kind of energy that they produce is unreliable and uh, very expensive. Now, well, Dan, 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 ex ex Dan, uh, Dan, Dan you're filibustering again, please. No, I'm not filibustering. You, I'm Dan, you, Dan, okay, Dan, you talk happened, and talk and talk. I'm not going to let you get away with lying. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Dan, Look, I'm going to give you a chance to respond Look, in a moment. Uh, okay. the, and he also mentioned the CAFE standards for automobiles, corporate average fuel economy standards. Right. The president uh, simply implemented the law that Congress passed in 2007 to, to raise the, the fuel economy to 35.5 miles per gallon by, I think, 2016. But now he's gone forward and gone to 54.5 by 2025. The problem is that the technology that will allow us to get that kind of mileage for cars that people want to buy is not there, and we're already seeing that. Okay. The companies that have forced these, these models that will get very high mileage onto the market are finding that they're not they're simply not ready the, the Chevy right, Volt catches fire for example right let's get uh, Daniel Weiss's response okay well let's let's talk about some facts here instead of some rhetoric uh, first of all under, under this president we are now a net exporter of solar technology in other words we're building solar equipment here that's being exported to other countries we're a net exporter of solar equipment to China so these investments are paying off second uh, in the, uh, when it comes to electric vehicles, which uh, Myron was referring to, uh, in the first year of Priuses and Honda Insights, the hybrid technology of which there's several million on the road now, they sold less than 10,000 of those vehicles. The first year of the electric vehicles, we've sold twice as many. We've sold uh, 18,000. It takes a little time for new technologies to be adopted. In Myron's world, we would keep doing things like we've always been doing things, regardless of the consequences to everyday Americans and to our national security. What this president is about is trying to move forward in a way that is steady, sure, not revolutionary, but evolutionary, that creates jobs and protect public health. Okay, That's I want to look problem. at the international picture uh, here. Um, let's let's look at uh, take a closer look at the top carbon dioxide emitters around the world. Now, the United States emitted more than 5,000 million tons of carbon dioxide in 2009. Compare that with China, now the world's largest polluter. It emits more than 7,000 million tons of carbon dioxide. And India, the world's third largest polluter, emitted more than 1,500 million tons. Rick Pills, I mean, if we look at the attempts that have been made uh, to regulate this, you know, we had Kyoto, which we know what happened to Kyoto. Then we had Copenhagen. We had the Durban Conference. Nothing much has happened. Is this, well, the Durban Conference, let's say, for instance, does that signal the end of any serious discussion on international legislation to regulate the emission of greenhouse gases? Well, I don't think that you're going to see any big, grand international agreement uh, to strongly regulate greenhouse gases any time in the near future. But, uh, coming out of Durban, there was an agreement to keep talking toward a future uh, agreement. It's a global problem. It's going to need global participation, including from China and India and Brazil, as well as the U.S. and the other uh, uh, industrialized uh, countries to solve. But I think it really sends a bad message to the rest of the world that the U.S., which has been unwilling to do anything to fundamentally change its own trajectory, um, to start demanding that, uh, I mean, China has four or five times as many people as the other. The per capita emissions are, are way lower. To start demanding that other countries start constraining their development and limiting their emissions um, before we'll come to the right. table and talk about anything. It's really presumptuous. Okay. 
That's you where we have to leave it, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, Dan, oh, we've sorry, run out of time. We're going to have okay. to leave it there. Thanks, Thanks to Thank all you, of you Dan. for joining us. Thanks. Thank you. And that's it from the team here in Washington, D.C. for now. But we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. You can send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AljazeeRa.net. Bye for now.